Coming up, success isn't the only thing that drives McKenna to finish the race and meet an artist who performs while he paints. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada, and I've got a question for you. Oh, okay. Uh, when we say give God glory, like what does that mean? You know, it's a good question. I had a neighbor ask me that question once, okay. and I was literally stumped. Like, um, I don't know, but so I looked it up. Okay. And when I looked it up, I found a great word that helped me understand giving something, someone glory. It's giving them the credit. Oh, I like that. Right? So when we give God the credit for something, if we say God did that, we're giving him the glory. Well, I like that because glory literally in the Latin is doxa or where we get our word doxology. And that means to express an opinion or value. So you're right. It's not only uh, giving someone respect with a tangible item, but also in your words, your right. thoughts. It's, I love that. Giving someone the respect they deserve in word, thought, and deed. Yeah. Good job. Well, you know, I had to look it up because it is a question. We often use that phrase. We don't know what it means, right? Yeah. Well, up first, this is how faith helped McKenna drive to, to success on the racetrack. I would love to be a race car driver. Girl. I bet you Did would. Did I ever tell you that? I bet you would. Watch this. McKenna Hassey has picked a daring profession. Race car driving is like riding a bull, just trying to control something that is kind of uncontrollable. 950 horsepower on a 1,400-pound frame. Just those extreme forces now try and drive the roller coaster. The sprint car driver's first win came as a 14-year-old, but her young success hasn't created what her hassy rhyming nickname might suggest. Uh, I was probably one of the least likely candidates to be doing what I'm doing, and you just know that God's trying to use that for good. McKenna's fast track to a racing obsession began with a random meeting. I was on vacation with my family in third grade. We went out to eat at a shopping mall, and there was a famous NASCAR driver there signing autographs. I became a huge fan of his and a huge fan of NASCAR after that, and that's where my passion for racing began. McKenna became the first female to win at the Knoxville Speedway, the sprint car capital of the world. The Iowa native doubles as her own marketer, recruiting sponsors. I'm just honest and I try to be raw and real about who I am and what I'm doing and why that's beneficial for them too. Really about the relationship and the partnership that grows over time. The business was just clearly a part of my life from the time I was little and kind of a gift from God that I've always been passionate about, that I always love selling. Her business sense isn't the only trait that makes McKenna unique in her sport. You're the only female in a sea of thousands of men my gender has by far created uh, the biggest challenges that I've faced th throughout my career and continues to. Uh, I think it comes down to just including God in that matter and letting him lead him. McKenna's rare attributes match sprint cars' distinct style. It's such short, quick, fast, intense racing. Sprint cars can get around a half mile track in 14, 15 seconds. We race on dirt, and as the dirt starts to slick off, now you have cars going 140 miles an hour, essentially on ice with 24 other cars around you. A race car is a machine, and it's an animal, and it's working against you, and your goal is to get it to work for you. So I think that's just the greatest satisfaction, flirting with the danger, too, in order to succeed. The flirt with danger comes with the territory of racing. I had a really bad crash trying to pass for the lead, and I flipped like six times and my helmet came off. And after that crash, I always had this vision of Jesus in my cockpit covering my head as I was flipping. So that was really when I started praying a lot and I got involved in a college ministry and that absolutely transformed my life and really opened my eyes to God. On the dashboard of McKenna's car is a prayer she recites prior to the race's start. Lord, I pray as I race today, keep me safe along the way. Not only me, but the others too, performing the jobs they do. I know God that in a race, I the driver must set the pace, but in this race of life, I pray, help me Lord along the way. McKenna continues to merge the life she lives to the profession she chooses, confronting her convictions against the potential of awaiting fear. Coming to terms with death on the racetrack, but still live in freedom, because you know, A, what's on the other side of that line, and B, you know that you have a savior that knows exactly when you're going there. God literally controls the wheel, right? And so many of my wrecks, I didn't walk away because I should have or because it made sense. I walked away because God wanted me to walk away. 
And for me, I would rather lead a life of significance than a life of length as it pertains to the kingdom of heaven. McKenna owns and runs Compass Racing Development, a program preparing young drivers to make educated and professional impact in the race car industry. I believe that you shouldn't wait to give back. You shouldn't only limit your love to certain people, to certain environments. Uh, God calls us to treat everybody like family, and I try to love those kids and my fans and everybody around me like they are family. Acts 2024, 20, my life is worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. My whole life in one verse, my life is worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race. What you do on this earth matters. I want to lead people to Christ. Like, that's why I'm here. I want to be a light wherever God has me planted on earth. Then it matters when you get to heaven. Wow. I don't know if I'd actually like to be a race car driver like McKenna, I, but I'm super inspired by her and the way she lives her life. Listen again to her life verse and the model for how she lives her life. It's from Acts 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. That's quite a verse. Let me ask you, how do you consider or view your life? Is it something you hold on to lightly or tightly, <laughs> only wanting what feels safe or maybe comfortable? I think this is actually the human way, to not take risks, to not give too much away. This is a short-sighted way to live. And this verse tells us that we're to consider or view our life as worth nothing to us, but to see our lives as a race with one main task, to tell of the good news of God's grace. See, this is the only way to live, not to bring attention to yourself or to accumulate more stuff, but to literally live a life that tells and shows the grace and goodness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.20 tells us this is actually our calling. It says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Well, it's true. That's who we really are. We are his representatives. We're here to demonstrate and show the goodness and grace of God. How are you doing with that as a life goal? We have a resource for you called Your Identity in Christ. It's free. It will be a rich teaching for you. Why don't you call us at one 855 700 Take some time to think about how you are viewing your life. Up next, Jared shares how God gave him the opportunity to inspire others through his art. What is an estate plan and do I need it? An estate plan ensures your stuff will be distributed in the best, most tax efficient way. We plan so many other things. Why don't we plan our wills? Creating a plan for your will ensures that you have taken into account any tax implications discussed options for the best way to pass on your stuff, thought about who would be the best executor, and considered your specific situation. 700 Club Canada has partnered with Advisors with Purpose to help you create a personal estate plan. Their services are free, confidential, and no one will sell you anything. Contact Advisors with Purpose today at plan at advisorswithpurpose.ca. Tucked alongside the Reedy River in downtown Greenville, South Carolina, are the popular art crossing galleries. There you'll find Jared Emerson, an artist who not only paints works of art, he performs them. A number of his performances have been portraits of celebrities who are sometimes in the audience. I've been able to do stuff with Tim Tebow, to Jerry Rice, to Jack Nicholas, uh, Carrie Underwood. It can be a little nerve wracking. But the pieces he loves creating most are those that point people to Jesus Christ. You start out creating things for your own enjoyment, your own pleasure. And then as you grow a little bit, you realize 
well, maybe I'm creating something because other people need to see it. When you're painting, um, you don't realize the impact that it's having on other people a lot until they come and tell you about it. But to have someone come to you and say, man, um, you know, I, I just haven't been coming to church in a while or I, I just been falling from God and, and that painting really spoke to me. For some reason in seeing that painting of Jesus, it was like him telling me, hey, I'm here. Jared was brought up in a Christ-centered home in Michigan. He remembers when his own faith in God became real when he was five. But I knew for me, my heart changed. And so instead of me thinking I was a filthy rag, I realized that I was actually his child and he loved me regardless of um, whether I obeyed or disobeyed. I just know that uh, I wanted to, as I grew older, to please him more and uh, learn and try to please myself less. He discovered his gift for art around seventh grade, but he had other things on his mind. At a young age, I wanted to play basketball. That was my dream, my hopes, my ambitions. Sports was my life. Being an artist wasn't really something that I thought I could be one day. Even so, Jared continued honing his artistic skills. It wasn't until after spending a year in Bible college and working in sales a couple of years that he decided to pursue a career as an artist. I think it started with me understanding the path that I was going down was trying to figure out how to be successful, how to make a living, how to have a family take care of them with art. Within a few years, he discovered how God wanted him to use his gift. It started when Jared's church made some videos of him painting and showed them during their services. And then they said, Jared, you should paint on stage. And, and I was like, are you crazy? Like me painting on stage in front of people? Like that's not something that I do. I was scared to death to be able to get in front of people and paint something. He'll never forget his first performance with an injured knee. And I realized I am on a slick surface. I have a bum knee. The paint starts seeping into the canvas. And so my first thought is selfishly, hey, what am I doing up here? I'm gonna come up here, throw some paint, fall down, and what's the purpose of that? And then my next thought was, God, I need your help. Despite his fears, it was a big hit. For me, it was the Holy Spirit just hit me and said, Jared, listen, if I can allow you to do something when you're broken, literally, and not 100%, look at the possibilities when you are 100% and the opportunities that I'll be able to give you to not only just get out there and throw paint, but bring honor and glory to, to my name. And it wasn't until I think I, I realized to let go and not have total control and let God take control that I changed my path. And that kind of brought me down to doing like the speed painting, the live performance art, where it became a ministry. Requests for Jared's performances started coming in from all directions allowing him to open his Greenville studio in 2006. Now he works at conferences, cruises, and gatherings of all kinds, doing what he loves and sharing his faith. And I never could really imagine or dream that I'd be doing the things that I'm doing today if it wasn't for that decision of, God, I need you to take over and take control of my life versus me trying to do it. So for me, it always comes back full circle. Jared, where, where is your heart today? How focused are you on my son? And not just creating art, but hopefully touching lives in the process. I know I can't touch a life, but I know God can touch a life. And if it's through art, then how cool is that? I may not know you, but I do know something about you. I know that you have a gift. I know that because you are created in the image of God and God gives gifts to every human being. Now, you may not think about it that way, maybe you've never explored it, but I do know that there's something deep inside of you that God wants to use to leverage for His glory, His name, and His testimony. Here's the deal. The Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul reminds us that we're like a body. We all have different functions, and it's only when we all do the things that we have been created to do that the whole body wins. And I've just come to the realization that a lot of us aren't fully operating in the gifts that God has put into us, or we're using those gifts for the wrong things, for our own sake. So I wanna challenge you. I wanna challenge you to find the gift that God has given you, and then I want you to think creatively about how you could use that gift 
to do a lot of good for the kingdom of God. I gotta think about it this way, I do love sports. And so you may think, well, sports doesn't seem very spiritual. Well, it can be when you use it to coach young athletes and encourage them when they ask the deep questions of life. Or there's a group of seniors in our church and we do a, a lunch outreach program to feed kids in need and they every week write cards, just little cards of encouragement. They're using a gift, writing cards and love to do that. Or our worship pastor, she goes into some of the darkest areas to reach women who are trapped in the sex industry. We can all do something, but we must all do something for the kingdom of God. And that's why I want to encourage you in that. And maybe you're like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what it means. I want you to call us right now at 1-855-759-0700. We have this resource entitled Witnessing. It'll give you some tools, some tips, some ideas on how you can leverage the gift God you gave you, just you, for his glory. We need you. The world needs you. God made you. And they want it. this world needs to hear your message. And so now, Raymond shares how God helped him escape a life of crime. I was taught that there's this balancing act of, uh, of good that had to outweigh your bad deeds. I constantly felt this tension of um, not measuring up. Raymond grew up in a Muslim home. He believed in God, but constantly struggled with the teachings of the Muslim faith. I wanted to know the reason why we were here. What purpose did my life had? Because I didn't get an answer to those questions, by the age of 10, I decided that I wasn't gonna follow Islam anymore. Unsure of where he belonged, Raymond looked for approval from his peers, but he found trouble instead. When I started pursuing crime, one of the first places that I found acceptance was in shoplifting. Uh, I would shoplift specifically candies and chocolate bars and stuff like that for my schoolmates, and that kind of surrounded me with, uh, you know, with a lot of friends. I felt more than just acceptance, like appreciated. By the time Raymond reached his teens, his sights were set on much bigger targets. When I was 16, I had, uh, I had started breaking into underground parking lots. Start a car with a screwdriver and we got a car started and we stole it and, and I'd gotten caught for that. That's when I landed my first provincial charge. By this time, I was just stealing for the sake of stealing. Life in the fast lane began to catch up with Raymond as his addiction to crime also became an addiction to alcohol, which played a part in him being expelled from high school. I was just drinking, I was just spending away my days holding employment just long enough to be able to buy more alcohol. And it was during a night out drinking with friends where Raymond went over the edge. I was out at a bar and an altercation happened that ended up with me stabbing a gentleman there nine times in the chest. Nothing was quite as significant as a wake-up call as the thought of possibly taking someone's life. But at the same time, I didn't know how to change. I had been so accustomed to this year, more than 13 years had gone by. Miraculously, the man survived, and Raymond spent only a short amount of time behind bars. Life slowed down just enough to give Raymond some much needed perspective. When I got charged for uh, aggravated assault, two Christian cousins invited me out to a Bible study at their church. And I remember that was just groundbreaking for me because it was the first time I had a perspective about life that made sense. Uh, I still, because of the things I was taught in Islam, didn't want to accept a, a man as God and didn't want to offer him worship in that way. Another thing Raymond wasn't ready to accept was that he had a problem. After he was released from prison, Raymond returned to a life of crime and addiction. I was out here in what I thought, where I thought I would be free and I wasn't any more free out here than I was when I was in there. And that really led to despair in life. Uh, it's what happened next that really began to transform my life. <laughs> the simplest way to put it is the Holy Spirit followed me home. I was sitting at an intersection. I had no license, a drinking and driving charge. I had, uh, I think, a fake insurance slip in, in my glove box. I had alcohol in the car. I had marijuana in the car, so I wasn't even supposed to be operating a vehicle. And a cop pulls up behind me. And all of a sudden, that's when I heard the voice say to me, they can come as close as they want to you, but unless I give the word, they cannot touch you. I can't imagine if this is God speaking, why he'd be protecting me. Uh, the cop turned right in the middle of the intersection and began going in the adjacent way. I drove two, two lights down the street and just saying, that couldn't be God. And all of a sudden, right in the midst of that doubt, 
another cop pulled out of a different parking lot and came behind me. And I heard the voice again. He said, they can come as close as they want to you, but unless I give the word, they cannot touch you. And I pulled out from that intersection, trusting, hoping that he would protect me. The sirens went off and I slumped back in my seat. I remember I was so angry and I was like, this is just like you, God. And as I'm in the middle of that thought, the cop pulls, drives around me and takes off. And now I feel totally ashamed because that's twice now this, in this evening that I doubted that he would protect me and yet both times he did. I had believed in God to be a certain way, but now he was revealing himself in a different way than, than, than what I thought. And it just terrified me. I was cut to the core. I fell to my face just bawling my eyes out. I, I realized that he was in control of the police that night. And I knew it was the God of the Bible speaking to me and that I had to get my hands on a Bible and, and, you know, learn what else did he say? What else is he saying? Raymond immediately started going to church and poured himself into community. I was going for everything. I was there on Sunday service. They had an evening service. I went for that. They had a youth on Friday. I went for that. They had young adults. I went for that. But I was just so hungry for the word of God and God was speaking so, so clearly to me. Today, Raymond has a passion for reaching prisoners with the gospel as Prison Fellowship Canada's national office manager. He is also the author of two books, Broken Hearted Joy and Servants of Light. A young boy who once struggled with purpose is now a man devoted to helping others find theirs. I think when we ask the question of uh, what's my purpose or what looking for meaning in life, God is so faithful. He doesn't tend to answer it for each and every individual out there. In order to be able to comprehend his answer to us, take time. And so it's not that God doesn't hear your prayers or that God has somehow overlooked you. It's just that God will answer in his time. Hi, I'm Julie Hunter, the Executive Director of Windsor Life Center. I would like to personally thank 700 Club Canada Partners for your generosity. Because of you, we can continue on with our programming. Windsor Life Center is an 18-bed live-in treatment center for women battling with drugs and alcohol addictions. These women come in broken from traumas, from abuse, from their addictions, and hopeless. But they leave after a year with us with new coping mechanisms, a healthier lifestyle. Most give their life to Jesus Christ and learn their identity in Him, and they have hope for their future. So thank you so much for your generosity. You know, one of the gifts that we can leverage for the kingdom of God is the resources he has blessed us with. And I know that in giving and generosity, we can do so much good. And I want to invite you to join us as we do our best to bring the message of Jesus across this nation and do good. And by joining the 700 Club Canada today for $20 a month or more, you'll receive this as a thank you gift. It's our latest CD, Putting on the Armor of God. So why not call us today at 1-855-759-0700 and together we can use all of our gifts to make a massive difference. Thank you. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Get putting on the armor of God. Pat Robertson records the book of Ephesians. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Discover the meaning of spiritual warfare, the importance of unity, the mystery of the gospel, the meaning of the armor of God, and much more. 
Plus, an exclusive conversation between Pat and Terry. Why is faith so important? When you have that kind of faith that the power of God is real, then the arrows of the enemy are not going to get to you. Find the wisdom you need to win the spiritual battles and live life victoriously. Putting on the armor of God, available now. Call or go online today. Well, we had a really great show, again, exploring kind of a concept that we've heard, but maybe don't talk a lot about, and that is how do we give God glory? And I loved how you explained that. Explain that again. Well, to give something glory is to give it credit, right? right? So I think, well, how do I do that in my life, like practically? Just yay God? Like, you know, what does that look like? But I actually think scripture talks about this a lot when it tells us to tell the story of God, tell what God is doing in your life, share your testimony. That's giving credit. You're saying, God did this in my life. Like sometimes it's easy for us to say, wow, look what happened. I, you know, I'm, I, I got better. Right. Or my kids came back to the Lord. You know, there's been a situation in our family. Instead to say, you know that God did that. That's giving him credit. I love that. So give God the credit for your story. But we also learned that you can also use your gifts because God gives you gifts. And so not only do you give him credit for those gifts, but to leverage yeah, them yeah. for the kingdom of God. What gifts has he given you and how can you use that to make a difference? I think that is another way that we give God glory. For sure, because even on the other hand, you can have gifts and use, use them for your own glory. Oh. That you take credit Mic for drop. it. Yep. Right? I agree. So I do, that's a very good way to express glory to God by saying, you know, this is a gift from God. Absolutely. And acknowledging that. Right? Yeah, that's so good. And I think another way, again, is, is in through prayer, yeah. right? We sometimes, sometimes think prayer is just asking for things, but it's actually sometimes just giving God glory, saying thank right. you. Yeah. And we do have prayer requests, and we're going to pray, believing that God's going to do something that you can give him the glory. And so Nancy said, please pray for my daughter. She's going through a rough time with mm-hmm. a really cruel landlord. So I'm going to pray right now, Nancy. Uh, For Nancy, I pray, God, that you would help her with her daughter's situation. Give her daughter wisdom and grace and your love. We don't know exactly what's going on with this landlord, but I pray that you would soften their heart to understand the situation and that you would be revealed and that this would be an opportunity for that landlord to hear your name proclaimed in a positive way. Would you receive glory in this situation? In Jesus' name, amen. So good. And Suzanne said, please pray that with God's help, I will be free from depression and anxiety. Well, Lord, we say yes, Mm -hmm. with your help, we will give you the glory and the credit for healing in Suzanne's life in Jesus' name. That's great. Well, what a great reminder today, Bill. Absolutely. And I hope it's encouraged you. Give God the glory, give him the credit, tell the story. Thanks for watching. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. Next, on the 700 Club Canada, pro golfer Bubba Watson shares how he has learned the true meaning of success and a woman learns to overcome a hidden shame. 